This is something that you said you never could have predicted would happen? I couldn't imagine a situation where um, I would call the police and they'd tell me they're not coming. It can't be that Jews are not safe in Israel. Welcome to Global Perspectives. In this week's episode, we're going to explore events in Israel which took place this past May. Israel's seven officially mixed Arab and Jewish neighborhoods, places like Haifa, Lod, and Akko, which had been extolled as models of coexistence, saw protests by their Arab residents turn into mob violence, which included gunfire, looting, stone throwing, firebombings of synagogues and Jewish homes, and lynching. I arrived in Akko in the early afternoon. The old city of Akko had been described as a model for the rest of the country, a place where Jews and Arabs live and work together. But it is here where during three days of rioting, Jewish businesses were set on fire, Jews were attacked, and ultimately, one Jewish man lost his life. My first stop was to meet Tamar Davidson, the owner of a hotel in the old city of Akko that was ransacked, looted, and set on fire. She has spent every waking moment since May reconstructing her hotel and trying to salvage her life's work. That night, where were you and how did you find out what was happening? The first night, um, we were actually in a restaurant in the old city when the um, demonstration was supposed to happen and we were told that it was going to be okay, that it was going to be fairly calm. Who, who, who said that? Who told uh, that? We got that from the police. The police. From, uh, yeah, from the police mostly. We were sitting in Roots, if you've seen the restaurant, right at the entrance to the um, Citadel, the uh, Crusader Citadel. Gorgeous place and all hell broke loose. It was crazy. At about 8.30 or 9 o'clock, we started hearing, um, I mean, it was very loud, just a lot of people, and it was very loud, and then we started heard it, hearing explosions, like uh, uh, firecrackers of different kinds, and um, maybe, uh, I don't know, um, different, um, different things the police use in order to uh, try to break up a demonstration when it goes crazy. And then uh, a big stone was thrown at the restaurant oh. at the front, uh, this beautiful big glass door. <laughs> so we had about 30 guests staying at the hotel that night. And our rooms are not in one building. We have one room in this building and we have 19 other rooms in different places along the alley. Oh my gosh. So they're spread out. And you know, it's the evening, people went out to eat at a restaurant and try to get hold of people. When we spoke to the police, they told us to tell the guests to stay in their rooms. That was their answer. It's a reality I never imagined we would experience anything like that. It's not, um, nothing we were prepared for, for. <laughs> not at all. Tamar, you're getting emotional, and of well, course I understand. <laughs> Who wouldn't? What, what are you feeling right now? What are you thinking about as you're getting emotional? Well, mostly I'd say that um, uh, our complaint or our um, dissatisfaction is mostly with the way the state is being run, unfortunately. There are criminals and there are terrorists and they are terrible people and they do terrible things, but the state exists and police exist in order to make sure that normal people who want to live productive lives can live normal, safe lives. And if the police tells us, tell your guests to lock the door and not come out, instead of coming in and taking them out of their rooms, we felt completely abandoned. It's, we had, you have no back. You expect somebody to have your back. And I expect the police to do that. And they didn't. 
the second night of the rioting, they broke into, rioters broke into the hotel and they set this on fire. So the entire reception, part of the furniture, everything here was black mm. when we got here. Everything was black. The Effendi Hotel was set on fire. Uh, the fire was put out to a degree. It's not like the whole building went up in smoke, but there was a significant damage and a lot of um, soot. And I mean, it was a life-threatening situation. I do remember on the first morning after the first night saying to my husband, They're gonna, they'll be back. If the, the police decided not to come in, they'll be back. And they were back, yes. I mean, they say they, which sort of gives them this anonymity and um, well, that, well, I that I want to change that, yes. Yeah, well, I want to ask you about that. Yeah, so who is the day? What's your understanding? Well, um, I do know that a lot of the rioters are local from the old city in Akko. And uh, some of them have already been indicted and hopefully the verdicts will be appropriate. Uh, I'm fearful, I really am. I'm afraid that, that things are not gonna follow through just like I know that um, not everybody who's been arrested is going to be indicted. I find it very, very frustrating I, to know that there are people walking around that I see that um, have attempted murder, that have destroyed people's property, that have destroyed life here. It's not only, I mean, property is something that you can rebuild, you can renovate, but it's gonna take, it's gonna take, I don't even know what it's gonna take. I don't want it to go back to what it used to be because that probably was not good if this happened. But um, a lot of work, significant um, efforts to build and establish trusting relationships between people. To try to understand the previous trust which had existed and what the community was like before the riots, I went to visit Kathy Raff, founder of Beit El Farasha. Hi. Hi, I'm Ellie. Kathy. So nice to meet nice you. To meet. Originally from the deep south in America, Kathy emigrated to Israel and established a hotel and community center called Beit El Farasha, Arabic for butterfly. Kathy has created a place where Jews and Arabs from Akko and across Israel can meet each other, cook together, participate in workshops, and hopefully build bridges. Hi, Amira. I met Amira, one of the Arab women who had received skills trainings at Beit Al Farasha. Amira has lived in Akko her entire life. I asked her about what happened last May, including the attack on Kathy's property. I met Amira. אני בטוחה שכל העקויים שגרים בעכו או ביפו או בלוד לא היו מרוצים ממה שהיה כי זה היה משהו לא טוב לאף אחד ואני מאחלת שרק יהיה שלום לכולם, לכולם Part of our idea is to number one support the women and number two more importantly, I think, actually, is to have a place where people that come to Akko and visit have a chance and an opportunity to meet local people. Because we feel that actually the real true gem of Akko are the people of Akko. But most people come and they spend the night in a beautiful hotel and they go out to eat, they walk around the shuk and they go home. But they don't have a place to actually have a conversation with the people that live here and hear about life in Akko and to really meet the, the other culture. So um, when we were thinking about a name, all of a sudden it realized that what happens here, we want it to happen uh, with the butterfly effect, that we have small little steps that happen with relationships, people meeting the other side, and then and the effect would grow and grow and grow as they sell, tell people about their experiences in Akko, that they had an opportunity to meet an Arab woman and to hear her stories about life and um, and how actually we're all the same. 
And the other idea is the lycometamorphosis, a butterfly goes from a cocoon, you know, starts as a caterpillar, turns into a cocoon, and then turns into this beautiful butterfly. And we hope that people themselves will change and become more open and beautiful as they meet something different from themselves. The events in May, uh, you know, what we all know is that tensions started in Jerusalem around the Sheikh Jarrah incidents. Then next thing we know, Akko, Lod, other areas in Israel, uh, there's rioting, there's looting. What happened here in Akko and specifically in Beit El Farasha? El -Farasha. <laughs> Um, well, I personally wasn't here. I just flown off to the States after a year and a half to, that I hadn't seen my almost 90-year-old mother. So um, I think in the end, maybe it was good I wasn't here because what happened were the nights that I normally am in Akko. Um, and if anyone would have asked me before that if this could happen in Akko, I would have put down a million dollars. No way that could happen in Akko. But um, the first night, I think Omar told you, they tried to burn the building down, and then I thought that that was it, that that would be the end of it. And then things got out of hand. They broke into the building, about six people or seven people actually happened to open up my cameras to see what was going on, and I actually saw them in the building destroying the building. Wow. So it was like pretty, oh my God, I can't believe it. And uh, your heart's pounding and you know you can't do anything about it. And I thought, you know, it's amazing a year and a half to build this place and literally five minutes to destroy it. <laughs> so everything was smashed. And, um, but at least my neighbors, nobody was hurt. I'm so sorry. And it must have been, you know, I can't even imagine the trauma and especially knowing that you've poured your heart and soul into this place and that this, this building is all about good and giving back to the community and helping, helping to elevate the local community, the local women. Um, I can't imagine the heartbreak. What's your guess about who these people were who first tried to burn your place down, then broke in and then stole? I think there are some elements of crime families in Akko. I personally don't know who they are. I'm not that involved with it, but I understand that the police know and the locals know and they threaten the locals. I think all the locals were, were threatened and were very scared for their own lives. And um, so I don't blame them. In fact, I feel bad for them. And I think that actually, maybe, I hope that from all of this mess that the police will finally get in and stop these crime families from doing what they're doing because they're suffering, the locals are suffering from them. I think they saw an opportunity and they went for it. To learn more about the events on the night of the attack on Kathy's hotel, I spoke with Omar, Kathy's Arab neighbor who actually put out the fire. אהההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההההה
לכיוון אחר, שהכיוון אנחנו לא רוצים אותו, והצד השני לא רוצים. אבל צריך לעבוד במקום באבן, גם צריך לעבוד בבן אדם. צריך גם לדאוג לצעירים ולילדים, לתת להם תעסוקה ולהפעיל אותם. לא רק לדאוג ללכת לישיבות של דו-קיום ולעשות אירועים של דו-קיום ולעשות אוכל ביחד, שני העמים, אז זה הבעיה. עשרים, חמש עשרה שנה לא לקחנו את הילדים שלנו ולא הכנסנו אותם לעניין הזה, לא אנחנו ולא המגזר השני הזה, הוא המגזר היהודי. כל עוד שיש אוכלוסייה חלשה, צריך לתת לו להרגיש לבן אדם כי הוא תושב, הוא תושב מדינת ישראל, הוא לא תושב מדינה אחרת שהוא גר פה. כל עוד שהוא מרגיש שיש זכויות בשבילו נורמלית ויש שירות, אז הוא ייתן את הנשמה שלו, אבל כל עוד שהוא מקופח ורואה את הצד השני שהוא עולה בירידה, אז הוא מרגיש בחוסר, אז הוא מתחיל לכעוס, אז הכעס מה נהפך? נהפך לעצבנות ונהפך לדברים אחרים. ואתה חושב זה... והבן אדם ילך לכיוון של, יכול להיות שהוא ילך לסמים, ילך לדברים אחרים. אז אנחנו כולנו כמנהיגים צריכים לחבק את כל הצעירים משני הצדדים. Well, you know, even your neighbors who I, just in this short time, uh, interviewed right before you, they were airing grievances about the Israeli government, about government policy, about feeling a lack of equality. And those grievances are not about a local crime family. Um, you know, when I asked them, what do you think what, what, what these incidents are about, they were sharing these grievances with me. So what about that? I don't think that what happened here was because of those grievances. And, you know, I don't believe that the, our neighbors got involved in the rioting. I think they actually did the opposite. I think they tried to protect us and tried to, to stop it. So are there, is life perfect here? Absolutely not. And is it equal? Absolutely not. Um, but I'm not an Arab, so I don't feel what they feel. I don't experience what they experience. I want to stay on the perpetrators for a minute. So. You, you know that, um, that the, the rioters, the looters, the people who burned your property, that they're locals from Akko. Mm. What's the motivation? From what I see and from what I understand, uh, there are different motives um, that sort of converge. There's the issue of uh, Jerusalem and Al-Aqsa which um, some Arab leaders use in order to manipulate their own people into doing horrifying things. That's, the, that's one way for me to describe it, and I think it's a fairly accurate description. The Temple Mount is not in any danger of being taken away from the Muslims. Contrary is true. It, the only danger is that Jews will not be allowed to go up to Temple Mount. And if anybody controls it, it's not Israel. It's, it's the Waqf, it's the, the different Muslim leaders there. So there are people who like to push that button. And it manages to incite people who don't go to the mosque ever, who are not religious in any way. The Arab population in Israel and in Akko specifically, especially in the old city, a lot of the, the population uh, is not well off financially. Um, it's, a, a, I wouldn't say, it's not problematic in itself, it's problematic because then criminal elements come in. What was echoed by everyone was their bewilderment at the reaction of the police and the state for allowing this underbelly of hate and crime to exist. What about your trust? Uh, my trust is, well, I lost the trust in the police. Um, I felt like the first night that, that things were happened with Uri Buri and things were burnt, that nobody, nobody could have seen that coming and it was a shock. But the fact that the police made a decision not and told everybody they're not coming into the old city after that, like if they would have come in the next day and put either the army or the, or the police, I mean, it's very easy to close off the entrance and the exit to Akko. There's only three of them. You know, I think that all of the vandalism and the thievery that happened would not have happened. What do you think needs to happen next? The police has to enforce the law. That would make me very happy. And um, myself, my husband, and other 
people who deal with tourism here especially, we've gone to the police, we've spoken to the police, we've, we're in constant, constant contact. What do they tell you? The choice not to come in and to basically say this neighborhood is off limits. For what reason? What did they tell you why they chose? That they're not, do, they're not going in unless there's um, danger to lives. And um, I, from what I understood from them, mostly it was in order not to um, inc further incite the, the so population. So the police thought that if they entered into Old Akko, mm -hmm. they would escalate by doing mm -hmm. that. And your belief is that it would have been the opposite. Definitely, I definitely think that. I, I know I'm not in police I'm not in law enforcement, but um, if there's a constant vacuum there, and, and it's, it, this is not something that started the night of the of the riots. This is something that's been going on for a very long time, and it's been going on for a very very long time, especially in Arab uh, cities and villages. Police just doesn't go in. It's interesting because in Europe we hear about no-go zones and what you're describing to me sounds very similar to the mm -hmm. European no-go zones. So, you're, so in essence we're hearing that in Israel there's no-go zones where the police won't enter. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so what happens as a result? The local population just uh, has control over the area? Mostly criminal elements in the local population. But here we're talking about Israeli Arabs, mm -hmm. right? Let's name it. Mm -hmm. We're talking about areas where the population is majority Israeli Arab mm -hmm. and Israeli authorities are reluctant to go into those areas and really assert their authority. Mm -hmm. For years, I, am, I think the policy was uh, just let them kill each other, which sounds horrifying and is horrifying. There's a state, there's a government, there are laws. The laws should be enforced. There's, I, I don't see any question marks there. If somebody is a criminal, it doesn't matter if, he's, if the crime is terror or the crime is theft or is whatever it is, you have to deal with crime. Now, this is something that you said you never could have predicted would happen. I, I couldn't imagine a situation where um, I would call the police and they'd tell me they're not coming. That's, that, that was the issue. But, we but called the police. I called the police three consecutive nights telling them there was smoke coming out of our buildings. They wouldn't let the fire department come in without police security and they wouldn't go in. So they, they just didn't go in. I'm not, I'm not diminishing in any way the issue that, it be, that, it is that it's a national issue and that it's Arabs who are targeting Jews. It's definitely that. To me, it felt like it was 1929 like it was 1936 in Israel, where uh, the Arabs murdered Jews because they came to live in different places. That's what it felt like to me. And the state of Israel has to pull itself together and has to make significant changes and take a stand on this. This is not, it's not there's, it can't be that Jews are not safe in Israel. Do you think there's political will in Israel to deal with this? I think in order to deal with it, um, there are polit politicians will have to make a brave decision that says that basically they want the Arab Israelis to be equal citizens. They have to be prepared to do that. I know it, it may be, to some people it may sound like the opposite would be the right step, like to, um, um, to separate more and to segregate, but I, I don't believe in that. I believe that when people uh, live worthy lives and, and are productive citizens, then they want, to be, they want to live good lives. And most people want their children to have better lives and to live prosperously. They don't want to live in chaos, the majority. But we all know that it only, you only need a minority to ruin it for everybody. And I should take the word only out because the minor if, if, that's the, if the minority is the one that sets the, the tone, then it's extremely significant. It's extremely significant. Despite these riots, the people of Akko remained hopeful that one day they could live again side by side as Jews and Arabs. אני מקווה שיהיה שלום לי כולם, שיהיה שלווה ואף פעם לא יקרה זה עוד פעם. 
Do you think your neighbors feel that the future is together? Absolutely. I believe 100% in ACO and the people here, and that's why we're rebuilding and starting over because we will never give in to hate and we'll never give in to this type of behavior. And we believe in building for the future, and the future is together. I think that the rioting that happened was something with the stars lining up in a very strange way between all of the things that led up to it. I think it was a real, I believe it was a once, I mean, like I said, it's never happened before and I really pray it won't happen again. While Jews around the world face escalating and often violent anti-Semitism in countries around the globe, Israel is understood to be the Jewish state and ultimately the Jewish haven, the one country on earth where a Jew can live without fear of an anti-Semitic attack on himself, his family, and his children. The events this past May in these mixed Israeli-Arab towns seem to have blown a hole through this premise. Allow me to clarify this point further. While Israelis have always found themselves the targets of Palestinian terror on Israeli soil, there was perhaps a never stated but clearly understood contract between Israelis and their government that in the Jewish state of Israel, Jews would not be attacked and victimized in their own homes due to the hatred of their neighbors. But as we just heard from Kathy and Tamar, and perhaps would have heard from Israel Prize winner Avi Har Evan, the former head of Israel's space program, who at the time of the Akko riots was a guest at the Effendi Hotel, which was firebombed, causing Avi's death. These Jews in Akko did indeed find themselves under attack from their Arab neighbors, and the representatives of the state, that is, the local police, failed to protect them and their property. My time in Akko and the hours of research I conducted for this episode have left me with one gnawing question. Does the Israeli political establishment have the will to protect its Jewish citizens and ultimately to make the pledge that Israel will be the one country in the world where anti-Semitism is not tolerated? Thank you for joining me on this episode of Global Perspectives. Join me the next time.